Good morning, everyone. My name is John Phipps, lead pastor of Park Place Church here in Pinellas Park, Florida. And uh, it's my honor and privilege to share with you our devotion this morning. Uh, we're still working through Revelations. This has been a uh, two-week process, though we did take um, a couple weeks off after the first week. So this is day two of the second week. Thank you, Becky, for joining me. Good to see you and Pam. <clears throat> well, listen, we had an interesting... Um, lesson yesterday in which we talked about the dragon who we understand is symbolic but is not just symbolic the dragon is satan himself and so the bible tells us that um, but then there's this question of the beast and so we're going to unpack that a little bit i kind of left it as a cliffhanger yesterday saying i was going to do a little more research and i have um trying to make a distinction good morning rick how are you my friend and pam good morning I want to make a distinction between the dragon and um, the beast, the beast out of the sea <clears throat> from Revelation 13. Now, we're further along in that. In fact, today we're going to get into Revelation 14 and 15. Good morning, Linda. Thank you for joining us. So as we start to kind of unpack more of this, hi, Jan, um, we're going to be learning a little bit more about this. And as we're into Revelation 12, 13, 14, and 15. I just want you to know we're almost finished with Revelation, actually. Friday will be finished. Uh, and then next week, I'll just do random um, uh, devotions, and certainly I'm taking requests. So anything you want to share, anything you want to learn more about, it can even be topical. It doesn't have to be a piece of scripture. It can be um, a study on... Um, Maybe you've got some questions on tithing. Uh, I'd be happy to do a two or three part series on tithing or something along that line. Whatever you want, just let me know what your thoughts are. I see you all there. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, everybody. So, <clears throat> um, the reason why Revelation 12, 13, 14, and 15 are difficult to interpret and understand is simply because um, a lot of it is symbolic and even scholars are in agreement. And so you know that I'm not a scholar. I'm getting a lot of my information from scholars I like. But I'm also looking at scholars that I don't necessarily agree with and listen to. And that's okay, isn't it? I mean, honestly, um, just because they don't think like me or they don't have my viewpoint doesn't mean they're not right. Uh, one day we'll find out who's right and who's wrong, and it won't matter, I guess, at that point. But we've got 11, 12 people on. How are you guys doing? I'm going to get started usually when we hit about 20 listeners, 20 people joining us. So how are you doing? Many of you joined me last night, and uh, we had our uh, wonderful hour-long prayer time, and that was great. Thank you for joining us last night for prayer. And a lot of great requests, a lot of praises are being lifted up. God is good, and uh, I love answered prayer, don't you? <clears throat> good to see you this morning, everybody. I see your names there. Judy, thank you for joining me this morning. This is a devotion this morning, Judy, on Revelation. We're going to be looking at mostly Revelation 14 and 15. So we're going to be talking about the 144,000, and it's going to be really, really interesting. But I need to clear up something from my devotion yesterday, which had to do with the dragon, who we know is Satan, and the beast out of the sea. And are they the same person? Are they different? Are they a variation? Um... We're at 22, so we can go ahead and get started. We've got 22 people watching. Good morning, Judy. We'll eventually get to probably 30 or 40. <clears throat> I think yesterday we had almost 45 people watching, and that was great. And that was just in the live feed. I do post this to Facebook, and feel free to share it with others if you want to. I just want to share a few things about yesterday's lesson before we get into today's and um, try to recap some of this. The similarity between Revelation 13.1 and Revelation 12.3 show a direct relationship between the dragon viewed in heaven in Revelation 12 and the beast rising out of the earth. This relationship between these two is further confirmed in Revelation 13, 4, which is what we talked about. And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. Okay, so we're learning that the dragon and the beast are different. And so there is this, this uh, shared power, this shared authority um, to the beast showing that the beast on earth receives its power from the dragon, okay? There is another commonality. 
both the dragon in heaven and the beast on earth have seven heads and ten horns. But there are two distinct differences. <clears throat> One is the number of crowns, seven on the dragon and ten on the beast. The second is that the crowns on the dragon are on the heads, while the crowns on the beast are on the horns. It is unclear what these differences mean, but they may reveal a relationship between the beast in Revelation 13 and the beast in Daniel 7. I read to you yesterday some of Daniel 7. The beast in Revelation 13 is a further illustration of the fourth beast in Daniel 7 with its ten horns, uh, the ten horns representing ten kings um, who will be part of the beast and present possibly when Christ returns. Good morning, Nona. Thank you for joining me. So, again, shared responsibility, different entities, but working together, a lot of commonalities, okay, between the dragon and the beast. <clears throat> and then I found this, and I like this too. This is not a writer that I, um, I usually use or a commentary that I typically use, but I want to share it with you. Um, the battle of Armageddon will be the last battle before Christ begins his rule on earth. The armies that oppose Christ will be both human armies and armies of evil spirits. They will have three principal leaders who will persuade them to gather for battle. Some of this goes along with one of my favorite preachers, which is John Hagee. John Hagee preaches a lot about end times prophecies. He speaks a lot about Daniel and Revelation. And so this is really interesting. I want to share this with you because I, I, I really like it. In Revelation 16, 13, those three leaders, okay, known as the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, okay? So we're looking at three. You can call it the false trinity if you want to. A dragon means the most terrible animal that anyone can imagine. That describes the cruel and evil character of the devil, okay? We know Satan is the dragon, the devil. Therefore, in the book of Revelation, the dragon means Satan, uh, chapter 12, verse 9. <clears throat> the beast, however, means a dangerous wild animal that describes the Antichrist, the great ruler who imitates Christ in order to oppose him. We get this from Revelation 13, verses 1 through 8. So we're making a distinction between, so far, the dragon and the beast. This particular author who is saying that... <laughs> Um, all of this is Satan, but the Antichrist is not necessarily the dragon. The Antichrist is the beast that rises up from the sea that we, we talked about in chapter 13. All right, let's talk about the false prophet. A false prophet is someone who declares the words of a false god. In the book of Revelation, the false prophet, also called a beast in Revelation 13, 11 through 17, speaks on behalf of the Antichrist. It is by their words that the devil, okay, the Antichrist, and the false prophet persuade the nations to gather at Armageddon. <clears throat> Those words are evil words and lies. John describes, John the writer of Revelation, John describes those words as awful spirits that come from their mouths. He also describes them as frogs, small animals that jump suddenly. People considered frogs to be unclean and unpleasant animals. Now, if you look at Exodus 8, verses 1 through 15, it supports this. Now, we're just talking about John's interpretation. And again, our interpretation is taking from John's writing and his understanding of what he saw. However, the words have great power. They carry out astonishing acts. The Antichrist will have authority over the whole world. Now, that's true, and we learn this from Revelation 13, verses 7 and 8. Therefore, the kings in Revelation 16, which we're going to get to, are rulers with less authority than the Antichrist. Again, these are rulers, so there's shared authority. Uh, good morning, Tricia. Good to see you, my friend. Uh, however, they will support him completely. They will order their armies to gather for war against God himself. So, is it fair to assume that if there is a trinity... Of course, we believe there is because we're Christians, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. All are uh, triune God, okay? They're all part of the Godhead. Then it's 
fair to assume that this shared re authority and responsibility would be the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Shared responsibility, shared authority, all with different functions, okay? Satan wanted to set himself up in heaven and be like God and be worshipped like God. And certainly the Trinity is nothing new. So even before Lucifer was cast out of heaven, Lucifer got to see the Trinity, my friends. Don't let this blow your mind. Good morning, Eva. So think about that for a moment. <clears throat> Why wouldn't Satan then, after he is cast from heaven as Lucifer with a third of the angels, the stars, right, wiped out, thrown to the earth, why wouldn't he want to set up something toward the last days in which um, not only is there a spirit of Antichrist, or his spirit is here on this earth, but furthermore, he is setting himself up as, you know, something comparative to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now we're talking about the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, all right? So I'm just trying to unpack a little bit of this for you. You may disagree, and if you do, that's fine. Um, you can write to me if you want to, or, you know, post on Instant Messenger. I, I'm not willing to defend this necessarily. These are um, people that, that I like and respect who are sharing their views about all of this, which is symbolic, and I'm just trying to break it down for you. So if you don't agree, um, that's okay. I'm not willing to lose blood over any of this, but I do think it's important for us to study it and learn it. All right, let's get now into the Word of God. We are looking at Revelation 14. And 15 today, <clears throat> and we're going to start by reading verses 1 and 2. So the Lamb and the 144,000, Revelation 14. Then I looked, and there before me was a Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who have had his name and his Father's name written on their foreheads. Verse 2, and I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters, and like a loud peal of thunder, the sound I heard was like that of a harpist playing their harps. Difficult. Guys, it is getting more and more difficult. So there's some very simple things that I can explain to you here. There's some other things that, that I can't explain to you, and really nobody can, but we'll find out someday. First of all, who is the Lamb? We all know the Lamb to be Jesus. Jesus is the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world, John the Baptist said, and that's true. It also spoke about Mount Zion, okay? Mount Zion is an Old Testament reference, but this refers to heaven, and so we interpret Mount Zion as being heaven. And let me just read to you Hebrews 12, verses 22, 23, and 24. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an, an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator under the new covenant. Okay, this is Hebrews 12, 22, 23, and 24. So it's talking about Mount Zion. Mount Zion is the new uh, Jerusalem, okay? Or heaven, if you want to say that. Let's take a look at Revelation 14, verses 3 four, and five. Verses three, or verse three. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They followed the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Okay? In verse 5, no lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. So, <clears throat> a lot of um, discussion about who the 144,000 are. Um, I don't know that I have an answer for you exactly, but I've done a lot of research. Some have said this is a spiritual, symbolic description of God's people. I tend to think it's more literal, but what we do know is that they're virgins. There's a spiritual purity and faithfulness, and I, don't, I think that's what it's referring to, is a spiritual purity and faithfulness of the 144,000. 
we understand that these are disciples of Jesus. If you look at Matthew 9.9, 9, it references this. Matthew 9.9. 9. They are following the Lamb. They are disciples of Jesus. I also believe they're redeemed. We know that. Jesus died for them, so therefore they are redeemed. They are the saved. They are Christians. Okay? Um, I know much is being said about them being only Jewish people. Um, I don't necessarily... Um, agree with that but if you do that's great and i support that a lot of people do support that i just don't necessarily lean that way but i don't lean strongly the other way either and uh, my first point or my last point about the 144,000. good morning joy and dari thank you for joining me is they are the first fruits of god in the harvest of the souls and we're going to be talking more about that so the 144,000 <clears throat> are special these are people that have gone through um, a certain portion of the tribulation. How much? We're not quite certain, um, but very clearly we understand that they are special. They have not taken the mark of the beast, and they will be greatly, greatly rewarded. Thank you, Dari, for sneaking out and catching a little bit of my devotion. Let's take a look at uh, Revelation 14, 6, 7, and 8. Then I saw another angel flying in midair. And he had an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Verse 7. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Now we're going to look at verse 8. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen, is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Okay? Now, John saw three angels making proclamations regarding Jesus' victory. God is giving the inhabitants of the earth another chance to repent, or some people believe. Okay? This is a, another viewpoint. But it does make sense. And I don't lean too strong one way or the other. I've, I've, I've read a lot of commentaries on this particular thing, but let's just stick with what we know. Angel number one, he came to preach, okay? He came to preach the everlasting gospel to those that were on the earth, okay? Uh, to fear God, to glorify God, to also make them understand that God is a judge, okay? And his proclamation was to worship God the Creator. Okay? So, the three angels that we're talking about, the first one um, said all those things. Fear God and give Him glory in verse 7. Worship Him, he says. And so he's a preacher. Now, why would he preach if some people can't be saved? If he's proclaiming judgment, that's one thing, but proclaiming judgment is not necessarily preaching. It's a proclamation of something, uh, a judgment or a prophecy that's going it's to, a, it's a proclamation of a prophecy of something that's going to come. Uh, good morning, Gloria. Thank you for joining me. So angel number two is a little bit different. Angel number two said, Babylon is fallen. That is the great city. Um, this is the first mention of Babylon in Revelation. And many think that it probably pertains to Rome. Um, but we're not sure. Babylon symbolizes a proud, idolatrous persecutor of God's people. So I tend to think that Babylon is broader than just Rome. Okay? And um, so that's the, that's the second angel. We're going to talk about the third angel in a little bit. <clears throat> but let's take a look at Revelation 14, 9 through 12. Revelation 14, 9 through 12. <clears throat> a third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives the mark on their forehead and on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. Verse 11. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and its image, or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. Verse 12. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands 
and remain faithful to Jesus. Okay? <clears throat> now, we're talking about the third angel. The third angel said, to those who worship the beast shall experience God's wrath. That's basically his message. Okay? They shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, and their punishment is in hell. The smoke of their torment rises forever and ever, and their, and, and, and their punishment is eternal. Okay? Um, so, the third angel is proclaiming judgment. The second angel is proclaiming um, um, Babylon, sharing about Babylon the Great, which some say is Rome. I say it's probably much broader than that. It's the spirit of the Antichrist, in my opinion, and persecution against the saints. And the first angel, of course, is preaching. So those are the three angels, okay? Let's take a look at Revelation 14. I know we're moving quickly, but we have to move quickly. Uh, again, this is a survey. This is not necessarily meant to dig, dig super deep. I hope that you're doing that on your own and you're enjoying that. Uh, Revelation 14, verses 13 through 20. All right. Let's look at 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, write this. Remember, John is writing these things down. He is literally a scribe. He is writing down Revelation, what he sees and hears. So I heard a voice from heaven say, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Making a distinction that from those who already died, such as our ancestors, and those who died from now on. Okay, in verse 13. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. Let's look at verse 14, and we're going to go all the way from 14 to 20. All right. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like the Son of Man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Verse 15. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud. Take your sickle, this is what he said, take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Verse 16. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Okay? Verse 17. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Verse 18, still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, take your sharp sickle and gather clusters of grapes from the earth's vine because its grapes are ripe. Verse 19, the angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. Verse 20. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for, the, for a distance of 1,600 stadia. Okay? Wow. Wow. Um, the one in the cloud we know is Jesus. So the very beginning of this passage of scripture, we know that. Um, but I want you to know that in what I read to you, there's actually two harvests taking place here. And so I want to spend some time talking about what I know instead of what I don't know. There are two harvests, not just one. Let's take a look at Matthew 13. If you have your Bible, flip over to Matthew 13. 24 through 30, okay? We're talking about two harvests. And um, <clears throat> Jesus is speaking about a parable in Matthew 13, 24. And another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the, tear, the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do, not, do you want us to gather them up? 
But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at that time, the harvest of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to be burnt, and then gather the wheat and then put them into my barn. Okay? So, when we read that, we're understanding that Jesus already foretold some of these things that are happening, many of these things that have happened in Revelation. Now, his 12 disciples that were with him didn't understand the Old Testament so ad adequately that they could, you know, listen to these things and compare what we now have is New Testament scripture from the Gospels to a lot of Old Testament. But when the Holy Spirit came upon them after Pentecost, these things were reminded to them through the work of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now, Revelation 14, 1 through 5, um, describes the blessedness that awaits believers in Mount Zion, which is heaven. Okay? So I'm just recapping 14 with you. Revelation 14, 6 through 20 describes the punishment and wrath of God that awaits unbelievers in the coming age. That is hell or Hades. So, we have a decision to, today of where we're going to go, where we're going to spend eternity. And that's up to us to decide. So even though a lot of these things can be very confusing for us, um, again, what we talked about were the three angels and the great harvest. And it appears to me that there are two different harvests okay not just one now some would say that's not true and they would oppose me and i'm fine with that i'm not advocating that i know for sure but from all of the commentaries and even researching this in the original greek um, as much as i can understand and interpret uh, i think that there it's quite possible that there could be two harvests let's take a look at revelation 15 which uh is referenced seven angels with seven plagues and also the song of moses let's take a look at revelation 15 verses 1 through 4 okay then i saw another sign in heaven great and marvelous seven angels having the seven last plagues for in them the wrath of god is complete and i saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire and those who have the victory over the beast over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name standing on the sea of glass having harps of god harps like harps you play with a harp like david played they sing the song of moses the servant of god and the song of the lamb saying quote great and marvelous are your works lord god almighty just and true are your ways o king now, I just received a phone call, and so my screen went black, but hopefully yours didn't. So, those who have victory over the beast are all the believers in Jesus, okay? They are pictured singing the song of Moses from Exodus 15, verses 1 through 21. The song of Moses from Exodus 15, verses 1 through 21, okay? Um... And if we take a look um, at that particular song, let's just take a look at this. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, quotations, this is what I say, this is what I'm singing now. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse of its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. So this is taken from Exodus 15, verses 1 and 2. This song was sung on Sabbath evenings in the synagogue to celebrate Israel's great deliverance from where? Egypt, right? In Exodus 15, God's people had come through the Red Sea into the Promised Land, and they were celebrating the defeat of their enemies, the Egyptians, who oppressed them for many, many years. But in Revelation 15, God's people are standing by the glass sea in the promised land of heaven, celebrating the defeat of their enemies, who are their enemies, the beast, sin, Satan, and the world. 
my friends. Think about that for a minute. So the spirit of the Antichrist is already here. And we know that the dragon is going to make himself known. The Antichrist is going to make himself known. The beast of the sea is going to make himself known. But all of those that have already fallen asleep, as the Bible refers to, those that have fallen asleep, they have died in Christ, they will be raised to the new heaven and the new earth, okay? Uh, Mount Zion, heaven, glory, that waits all of us. Now, in Revelation 15, God's people are standing by the glass of the sea of the promised land, heaven, celebrating the defeat of their enemies, just like we find with God's people, uh, uh, with Moses, okay? was preparing to bring them over into the promised land. And so, see what they worship God for. Number one, they worship God for his works and his marvelous ways. They worship God because God's ways are just and true. God's ways are just and true. Look, we don't have to understand everything about God. We don't even have to like everything that happens in life. Um, but, you know, when people come to me and they say certain things to me, like, you know... Um, why do bad things happen to good people? Or why, why would God take my father so young? Or why would you know God allow this catastrophe to happen to me? I always remind them that it is sin in this world that has robbed you of your joy, robbed you of your loved ones. It is not God that has taken your loved one. It is sin in this world. Now, God has a foreknowledge of all of these events, right? God isn't surprised by them. We don't live in a world in which God is surprised like we are surprised when, when, when something happens. But my friends, respond to these unbelievers or these seekers as saying things to them like, hey, God's not responsible for this. Remember, we chose to eat, the, to eat of the forbidden fruit. We chose our path. Sin is in the world. The spirit of the Antichrist, which is the prince of this world, this is his world. That's why God is making a new heaven and a new earth, my friends. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. My friends, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Why? Because this is Satan's dominion. For those of us that overcome by the blood of Jesus will be greatly rewarded. Now, there's only eight verses in Revelation uh, 15. So Revelation 15 is a very small chapter, but let's take a look at verses 5 through 8. <clears throat> After these things I looked, and behold, the temple and the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And there out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girdled or girded with golden bands. The one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels, seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Okay, this is very difficult, and a lot of scholars don't agree on, this, on these particular verses. We're talking about Revelation 15, verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. But let's go back to the Old Testament again, Exodus. So much of this is parallel with the book of Exodus. So let's look at Exodus chapter 40, verse 34 and 35. You don't have to go there. You can if you want, but I'm going to read it for you. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting, because the cloud rested above it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So God is getting ready to pour out his wrath on his enemies. And that is the plagues, my friend, the seven bulls. So even though 15 is very short, um, Revelation 15 has everything to do with the judgment of God, doesn't it? Because anytime it's talking about plagues, it's talking about the judgment of God. Yeah, you're right, Shelley, I agree. And so um, what we... What we can learn from these two chapters today as we're uh, preparing to finish Revelation this week is, <clears throat> is that um, there is still time for each and every person to come to Jesus. This is the blessed interlude between the first coming 
and the, and, the, and the last, the second coming of Christ. And all of us who are still alive, who still have a chance to repent of our sin, have an opportunity now to live above the forces of this world. Pastor, what does that mean? We have to continue to live in this world. Yes, we live in this world, but we aren't of this world. What I am saying to you is that we that are in Christ Jesus, that have been forgiven by the blood that he sacrificed for us, his blood was precious. We receive that. We receive the forgiveness that only his blood can allow us, atone for us to have. And that by receiving it, we are giving our lives to Christ. And then we no longer fit in this world's economy, this economy of sin. I'm not talking about a currency. I'm talking about an economy of sin, my friends. There's a difference. We no longer fit in the world's economy of sin, okay? So many things in this world that are considered right are wrong in God's economy. So many things in this world that considered, are considered wrong are considered right in God's economy. So God's economy of, of, of right versus wrong, sin versus righteousness, are at war in this world that we live in right now. My friends, we have to be counter-cultural, okay? I'm not saying to go out into the world and be offensive, but the Word of God is offensive, and I will probably offend some. Do you think Jesus ever offended anybody? How about when the disciples came to him, and uh, I think it was Peter, but I'm not sure, one of the disciples said, Lord, do you not know that you offended them? Meaning the Pharisees. And Jesus was not concerned about offending them as it pertained to the truth. Jesus wanted them to get their hearts right. And so if our hearts are right, sometimes the gospel presentation will be offensive, but that isn't our goal. Our goal isn't to offend but to share the truth in love. Amen? So, my friends, today you are being called by God to live counter-cultural, to not submit to the authorities of this world because the prince of this world is not your authority. The prince of this world is the dragon, is Satan himself, who has shared responsibility and authority with the beast and the, um, the false prophet. Okay, all of them make up the Antichrist or Satan. Okay, so we've shared a lot today. Uh, I try to stick within 30 minutes. We went 35, not bad. And we got through our two chapters. So I hope that you learned a few things. And uh, I just want to take a moment now to say thank you for joining me. It's my honor and privilege to be called your pastor. And I love Park Place Church, and I hope that we um, begin our services again soon. A lot of churches around us have already opened, and I'm happy for them. Uh, I know that we are not going to open in May, but I hope that we are going to open soon, probably in June. Um, but I'm working with my local board of administration, and we're going to open when we feel it's safe. And until then, you can count on me to be with you every morning at 11 a.m. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for those that have joined me this morning. Many, Father, will probably join me uh, when they get home from work and listen to this simple teaching. You know, Lord, there's a lot of things in Revelation we don't understand, and I don't suppose we're meant to understand everything. But we'll understand as much as your Holy Spirit enables us to. I think that, you know, the message is clear, that you're coming again. And when you come, you're going to come with all of the wrath of your judgment and all of your reward from your right hand. And you will reward those who lived a righteous life, who gave their hearts to you, Jesus. And that there will be poured out judgment from the seven bowls upon the earth for those that didn't. And I pray for anyone, Lord, that is uncertain of their salvation today that they would give their life to you, Jesus. They would repent of their sins, that they would come before you and that they would say, Jesus, forgive me, I'm a sinner. I have sinned greatly before you and I know you're coming and I know that your reward is with you and I hope that you would count me worthy to be your son or your daughter. And I repent of my sin and I turn away from it and I hold on to you, Jesus, and to your word and I pray that you would help me to live a countercultural life in this world, for this world is not my home. Father, we're reminded that we are only passing through, that our citizenship is in heaven, that we have been adopted into sonship, 
and that one day we will reign with you in glory and we will worship you for eternity and look forward to that day of Mount Zion, the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem. You give us what we don't deserve. And I am so grateful, Lord, because I don't deserve any of it. Neither does anyone who's listening to me today. But by the sacrifice of Jesus, Lord, we humbly accept it. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, my friends, for joining me this morning for our devotion. I love you, and uh, I encourage you today to reach out to someone today. Tell them you love them. Maybe you need to tell them you forgive them. Maybe you need to tell them that you're not uh, bitter with them anymore, that you accept them just the way they are. And um, make peace with others around you, my friends, because our time is short. We know that the Lord is coming again, and when he comes, his reward is with him. Be encouraged, my friends. I see your comments. Thank you. Amen, 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 and bless you. Thank you so much, Pam, for joining me this morning. Have a blessed day, my friends. I love you. Stay safe. Take precautions, and have a wonderful day.